Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're in for a real treat today. Uh, it's a, a huge pleasure to welcome Professor Sarah Garfinkel, who is currently, at, as we speak, actually in her new office at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience in, in University College London. And she leads a group there looking at clinical and effective neuroscience. Um, Sarah has a remarkable history in, the, in what you really is, is a new and, and quite innovative field of interoceptive neuroscience, the study of um, bodily experiences and their effect on our subjective and, and um, cognitive processes. She began her uh, science career in experimental psychology at uh, University of Sussex, uh, subsequently spent time at University of Michigan, um, has led her group in the University of, of, of Sussex and also collaborated closely with people like Hugo Critchley and, and has formed really part of a core group of researchers who focused on brain body interactions and how, how understanding those can help us in psychiatry. So um, I'm really pleased to introduce Sarah and she's gonna to speak today as her title slide shows on clinical neuroscience and the heart brain access. Sarah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you today. So I first became interested in how signals from the body may shape cognition and emotion during my time in Michigan. I was specialising in post-traumatic stress disorder, working with veterans that had returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I was in Michigan, so some of them went to Detroit and some of them went to Ann Arbor, and they were far from where the trauma had actually occurred. And irrespective of where they went, they always said the same thing, which is the world feels like an unsafe place. And this was particularly striking in the case of Ann Arbor, which just was like the most safe little university town. And my work then was looking at the role of the external context, safe context, dangerous context, and how individuals with PTSD may not be able to use external contextual information to guide safe memory recall. But I began to realize that this was only part of the story and the individuals with PTSD were so interesting as they had such different autonomic profiles. You would see, for example, increases in sympathetic activity, the heart was racing, um, hyperarousal symptoms. And it made me wonder, could there also be signals coming from the internal body that interact with the brain to drive the fear memories and fear feelings? So this really, helped ignite a body of research that I've been doing over the last 10 years, which is looking at brain-body interactions to see how signals from the body can guide how we think and how we feel. So when we think about um, uh, extraception, we think about how sensors tell us something about the outside world. And this is in contrast to interoception, which is the sensing of internal bodily sensations. Interoception is relatively new, so it was only differentiated from extraception by Sheringdon in 1906. And since then, interoception researchers really have struggled to agree on a definition of what interoception is. Um, uh, in 2016, 100 interoception researchers got together to try and come up with a consensus definition. It's still not adopted by everyone, but this is the one that I'm gonna to use today, which is interoception refers to the process by which the nervous system senses, interprets and integrates signals originating from within the body, providing a moment by moment mapping of the body's internal landscape across conscious and unconscious levels. And the work that I do is really centering on the heart, although other bodily organs can be looked at as well. And my work is really about delineating these different dimensions of interoception. So how can we systematically study interoception across different dimensions? And I'm interested in delineating these different dimensions to map out how they work and how they might be altered in different clinical conditions and how this can contribute to symptoms. So we have the afferent signal itself, and I'm gonna be working systematically through these different levels. So for example, in my case, I'm interested in the heart. You can look at, at the most simple level, measures like heart rate and heart rate variability. And this has been done for, for many, many uh, decades. And we can look at uh, individual differences in these measures. Here, I've just got a measure of heart rate vari 
variability using RMSSD, which is one of the most uh, accepted, uh, commonly used measures of this. Um, and this is work in close to 400 patients, but it's really just replicating what's known in the field, which is high heart rate variability is a healthy thing. You want the heart to be adaptive and varied. Um, and in individuals with no diagnosis, you can see the highest level of heart rate variability. In all of these different clinical conditions, you can see a decrease in um, heart rate variability with the lowest levels observed in individuals with schizophrenia. So as well as measuring the afferent signal itself and how it may change in terms of say its variability, you can also look at the neural signal associated with the afferent signals. And this can be done in different ways. One way is using E e.g. to look at um, uh, the heartbeat evoked potential in the brain. And work uh, here is showing individuals with um, borderline personality disorder, also known as emotionally unstable personality disorder. Um, and they're looking at the amplitude of this heartbeat evoked potential signal in the brain and showing an altered amplitude um, of this signal in individuals with BPD. New work um, that I'm doing in collaboration with Mahinda Yogaraja, who is a brilliant neurologist, um, who's also just moved uh, to Queen Square. Um, we're looking at how this heartbeat evoked potential uh, signal may differ in individuals with epilepsy versus those individuals who have non-epileptic seizures, um, uh, specifically those with functional uh, neurological disorder. And what we're able to show um, is that this HEP signal changes just before a seizure uh, in individuals who are having functional seizures, but not epileptic seizures. So it seems to be a marker. Um, and we just found out that we've got a CARP grant, so a clinician academic partnership grant to uh, pursue this uh, uh, in more patients as a potential diagnostic marker. So this heartbeat signal in brain is a potentially interesting signal that seems to be sensitive to uh, different uh, diagnostic states. Um, we can also look at how the preconscious impact of the afferent signal might change the way that stimuli are processed. We can look at this in different ways. One way that's been done since the 1970s is to look at cardiac timing studies. So we know that every time the heart beats, it sends a signal to the brain. So the, the brain is actually flashing in time with each heartbeat. Um, and this is a big oversimplification for the medics out there, so um, my apologies. But if you look at a T wave, um, you can see that this is um, when the cardiac ejection period is happening um, and uh, baroreceptors are activated and the heart brain channel is active. Um, for simplicity, I'm going to call this cardiac systole simply because it's when the heart brain channel is active. Um, uh, and you have R wave or late diastole in between heartbeats when this heart brain channel is quiet. And what you can do, um, and what people have done for many years now, is present short stimuli at different points in the cardiac cycle, either to um, get in between heartbeats or actually when the heart brain channel is active to see how this heart brain channel can change stimulus processing. And early studies um, initially looked at just sensory stimuli, so they would give people a painful stimulus and look at example um, people's reflex to the painful stimulus and they found that during cardiac systole or when this heart brain channel was active people had a reduced pain or reflective response to um, a painful stimulus. Uh, and this was consistent with this um, general inhibitory or interfering effect of the heart um, that was the theory of Lacey and Lacey, that anything happens when the heart is beating is likely to be dampened down or interfered with. And my initial works, one of the first studies I did looking at this, extended this into the domain of memory. So here I just presented words when people's heart was beating or in between heartbeats and then gave people a surprise memory test. Um, and I was able to show that people were more likely to forget a word if they saw it exactly when their heart was beating. 
So there's this consistent of Lacey and Lacey's idea that the heartbeat can have an inhibitory or interfering effect. Um, but I was really inspired by my PTSD work and I wanted to know whether the heartbeats were always inhibitory and maybe under some circumstances they could actually selectively facilitate some type of processing. And I wondered whether this heart brain channel might be particularly sensitive to fear. So in this study, I presented either fear faces or neutral faces on and off the heartbeat to see whether these cardiac afferent signals would selectively facilitate fear. And um, to look at this, we just got people to um, give intensity ratings on the continuous visual analog scale. And, um, and we did find this in the sense that fear faces were rated as more intense if individuals saw them at cardiac systole or T wave, um, consistent with this heart brain channel being active. And the reverse was true for neutral items. So here um, you see the general dampening down of um, stimulus uh, ratings with uh, these cardiac afferent signals. And these differences were reflected in the brain um, and amygdala activity appeared to track the cardiac facilitation of fear. So in the amygdala, there was greater signal to fear faces at systole relative to diastole and the reverse was true for neutral faces. And now we have this effect um, and it tells us something about how these cardiac afferent signals can change emotion processing. We can take this to a patient population to see if there's anything different about this heart brain channel in how emotion is processed. So this is in close to 400 different patients across all different diagnosis categories. Um, and again, we're just using this simple paradigm where we're presenting neutral faces or fear faces at systole or diastole to see how intensity ratings change um, as a function of these cardiac afferent signals. And we've replicated this neutral effect where you're getting reduced neutral intensity ratings to uh, neutral items at systole relative to diastole. Um, and this was most true in individuals with no diagnosis but it was observed in essentially every other diagnostic category with the exception of individuals with anxiety and schizophrenia. When it comes to fear, we replicated this small but significant boost of fear ratings um, with these cardiac afferent signals. This was further augmented in individuals with anxiety. And these were individuals with generalized anxiety disorder and this is telling us that in these individuals, there's something about this heart brain channel that further boosts fear intensity ratings. There was no cardiac modulation of fear in the rest of these different conditions. And in schizophrenia, and this is not something we hypothesized, we, was, we saw the reverse effect where these cardiac afferent signals actually reduce uh, fear intensity. So I've talked a bit about the afferent signal um, uh, itself, how it can vary, how it's represented in brain, how these afferent signals can change stimulus processing and how this may differ in different clinical populations. And now I'm gonna talk about interceptive accuracy, which for me is just one dimension of interception. Um, and interceptive accuracy is probably the most contentious part of interception research right now. I feel like um, we are all struggling to find paradigms which precisely uh, measure interceptive accuracy. Though historically heartbeat perception tests have been the dominant way of doing this. This is because the heartbeat is a discrete signal which is easy to measure and you can um, seemingly quantify quite well how able people are to detect the signal. Um, and this has been done traditionally, getting people just to count how many heartbeats they feel in a specified time frame. You can then compare that number to how many they actually have as a means to create an accuracy ratio. This has been criticized, this method, because people's higher order knowledge of heart rates might guide their response. Um, you can also use signal detection based measures where you present tones in sync or out of sync with the heart. So every time the heart beats, you present a tone or you present tones out of sync with the heart and people need to say whether those tones are in sync or out of sync um, and those synchronicity 
judgments serve as a measure of intraceptive accuracy. Um, and when you get people to do these tasks in a scanner, you can see uh, that uh, in this recent meta-analysis that the insula is an area that's uh, converged upon. They tend to activate the insula um, during these tasks. An early work by Hugo Critchley showed that accuracy in these tasks also correlates with right anterior insular activity. So the more activity you have in uh, this region when you're doing these interceptive tasks, the more accurate you are at these interceptive tasks. And also the gray matter volume of the insula as well correlated with people's ability to be interceptively accurate. And this interceptive accuracy measures a real individual difference. Some people are very, very accurate and some people are not. Um, and what I think is striking about interception is that it is not coupled to conscious access in the same way that extraception is. So while, of course, extraception is influenced and gated by attention, typically, if we're attending to something and it's above a threshold, we typically know if we've seen it or if we felt it, there is this capacity to access interception with conscious insight. We need to be able to navigate the world. Whereas with interception, our brains are processing things in our bodies all the time, and we don't necessarily want to be constantly distracted by them. And this has given rise, I believe, to this interesting uncoupling of conscious access to interception to some extent. So when you ask people, how aware are you at of bodily sensations or how good you think you are at detecting bodily sensations, these do not align with actual accuracy measures in the same way as extraception does. Um, and this I believe is important, especially when it comes to different clinical conditions. Um, so a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment is in, in individuals with autistic spectrum conditions. Um, and autism is a neurodevelopmental condition where individuals display alterations in emotion and self and other. Anxiety is also really, really, really comorbid in these um, uh, in individuals with autism. And actually you sort of seeing um, in the autistic individuals also having a comorbid anxiety disorder 23 to 60% of the time. And in the clinic in Brighton, it's really on the upper end of that. Um, and then from an interception perspective, you see altered insular reactivity and connectivity in autism. So you have vastly reduced insular connectivity in autistic individuals. And this is a key region for both sensing bodily sensations and also implicated in emotional arousal and processing emotion. So potentially speaks to emotion deficits arising in part from alterations in interception or the processing of bodily sensations. And I think the body is such an important thing in autistic individuals uh, that's often overlooked. So something that's been said, and it's something that I categorically disagree with, um, is it has been said that autistic individuals have deficits in empathy or lack empathy. And I don't think that's true um, uh, from, and when you look at the body, that tells a very different story. So in this work by Guatel, where they're looking at empathy for pain, autistic individuals are watching other people in pain and autistic individuals actually have a heightened bodily empathy response. So their skin contact sense response is actually higher to seeing other people in pain. Um, so it's not that they have a deficit in empathy, they're actually overreactive in a body way uh, to the pain of others. But potentially they are not able to use these signals or sense these signals in the same way. Potentially they're overwhelmed by them and they don't have precision into them. Um, and this maybe speaks more to an interceptive deficit. Um, and uh, an interceptive deficit in autistic individuals would potentially be consistent with a number of other features of autism. So for example, um, 
patterns of eating can be linked to interoception. Knowing you're hungry or knowing when you're full, that is an interoceptive signal. And autistic individuals um, sometimes overeat. They like a food and they'll carry on eating it. And maybe they're not getting the same um, fullness sensations from their stomach, or maybe they forget to eat and they're not getting the same hunger cues. Um, although I'm not talking about it today, there's lovely work by Tim Dalgleish and others showing that intuitive decision-making can also be uh, guided by interoceptive sensations. Um, and individuals who are autistic will often say that they find this sort of gut instinct intuitive decision-making quite hard and they'll often sort of have an overly irrational approach. Um, and emotion processing and a number of other things can also be guided by bodily signals. So um, we undertook the first study of interoception in autistic adults. And our hypothesis was that individuals on the autistic spectrum would have a deficit in interceptive processing. But um, based on reports that autistic individuals gave in the clinic, they often would say they're overwhelmed by bodily sensations. So we also hypothesized that if you gave them a self-report questionnaire, they'd have an over-inflated belief about their interceptive ability um, uh, that contrasts with our predicted deficit in interceptive precision or accuracy. So in this initial study, we just used one of these very simple, straightforward heartbeat perception tests, um, where we got people to count um, how many heartbeats they felt in a specified time frame, And here we saw that um, compared to individuals who did not have a diagnosis of autism, but were matched on various different dimensions, they had heightened interceptive accuracy relative to the autistic group. And this was a statistic that was significant at the group level. But if you actually look at each dot, which represents a person, you can see that this reduced interceptive accuracy was only observed in some of the autistic individuals and I really think this is important to stress that you can see sensory differences in autistic individuals that manifest in all different ways depending on the individual in question so some will be hypersensitive to let's say sound hyposensitive to texture um, and interception is maybe just another sense that might be altered in some autistic individuals. But quite strikingly, this deficit in interceptive accuracy in some individuals contrasted with this interceptive um, self-report measure where um, autistic individuals relative to a control group reported they were much more aware of bodily sensations. So they're much more pre they're actually preoccupied or feel that they're sensing them relative to um, a control group. This deficit in interceptive accuracy was replicated um, in a child and adolescent sample aged between 6 to 18, um, suggesting that it's something that might actually start early. However, it's important to note there's been other studies that have not replicated this finding, which is potentially indicative of the variation in the sample. And there's also really important work by Jeff Burr's group in Oxford saying it's not autism per se, which potentially is associated with these deficits in interceptive ac accuracy, is actually alexithymia. And alexithymia, as I'm sure you know, are deficits in emotion processing, understanding how you feel. So difficulty detecting emotions, difficulty identifying emotions. And um, uh, Jeff Bird would argue, and I'm inclined to be sympathetic to this notion, that um, it's the emotion processing aspects which are particularly coupled to impairments in interception. And I then wanted to further explore individual differences in um, interoception in this autistic and non-autistic cohort to see how they might link to differences in anxiety. As I said, anxiety is so comorbid in autistic individuals. So coming back to my own slide, I was interested in this discrepancy with poor accuracy or precision in some individuals, but a heightened belief. And I wondered if we could 
actually look at this in terms of an error score. So if we Z score both to put in standardized space and then subtract them, so how good people think they are relative to their actual accuracy to see whether we can get this error score and then see how it relates to anxiety. And we found that if you had a very inflated belief relative to actual accuracy and this error was large, that anxiety was large. And this made me hypothesize if we could increase interceptive accuracy or precision, um, could we actually reduce anxiety? And we first studied this um, in a proof of a principal pilot study, just in control individuals, uh, 50 initially, where we trained half the individuals to um, be to have more interceptive accuracy. To do this, we use just a very simple procedure. So while we typically measure interception at rest, of course, if we do something like exercise, then we are typically more aware of these bodily sensations. So we got uh, individuals just to do star jumps um, on the spot so that their heart was beating stronger and faster. We then gave them these little interception tests cones in sync or out of sync with their heart, counting their heart, and we gave them feedback about whether they were correct or incorrect. Um, and this was done while their heart beat was in an elevated state. So they had heightened interceptive feedback from the exercise and extraceptive feedback from us saying whether they were correct or incorrect. We repeated this over eight different training sessions, and then we tested their interceptive accuracy at rest at the baseline, midpoint, and final um, point. And what we were able to see was that interceptive accuracy significantly enhanced. And while this is not surprising for this tracking counting task, this could be guided by higher order knowledge of heart rate. I am very happy about this heartbeat discrimination measure, which is judging whether tones are in sync or out of sync with your heart, because there's nothing about higher order knowledge of heart rates which can help you do this accurately. The um, temporal nature of this is always the same in terms of whether the beeps are on your heartbeat are just time shifted off, and it takes a real precision to be able to do this. People typically perform at chance um, if they've not had training. Um, and it's actually an internal external integration task. It's very difficult. So I was really happy to see that this training was able to enhance this uh, D prime uh, sensitivity measure. Moreover, we saw drops in anxiety. That was significant uh, at the group level in terms of trait anxiety, but drops in both state and trait anxiety correlated with increases in interceptive accuracy. So interceptive accuracy did seem to be coupled with a reduction in both state and trait anxiety. Moreover, we gave people the Maya, I don't know if you know this, but it's a questionnaire to look at different self-report measures of interception. And we found that two other things were important as well, which was not worrying and attention regulation. And what this tells me is that it's not just good enough to have precision into your your body is also necessary to not worry about the bodily signal and this I think fits with early models of Clark that you and also potentially meditation strategies about just noticing what's going on in the body you want to be able to sense these signals but not worry about them also you need to have flexible attention anxiety is very much associated with attention too much attention to the body and you want flexible attention between the body and the world. And both those things, accuracy, not worrying about the signals and flexible attention seem to be predictive of uh, drops in anxiety. This pilot study then led to a full blown registered clinical trial um, uh, funded by MQ in 120 autistic individuals where they underwent interceptive training. Um, we called this AD, aligning dimensions of interceptive experience. And we scanned a subset of these individuals before and after, and we looked at changes in emotion and anxiety. And we compared this to an extraceptive training condition. Um, these were autistic individuals who underwent emotional prosody training. So they learnt how to recognize sentences that were said in emotional ways, in a disgusted way, in a happy way, uh, as an extraceptive emotional training, um, as uh, not knowing how people are 
communicating emotion is also something that can bring anxiety to autistic individuals. So that is an active uh, intervention, but in the extraceptive domain. And we also looked at measures of anxiety and emotion. And we replicated our, our pilot. Um, so what we found was that in terms of interoceptive accuracy, we saw an increase in this D prime value um, in our interoceptive training group. They were able to learn with greater accuracy and sensitivity um, this uh, interoception using the heart. Um, and then this is so interesting in terms of this questionnaire measure of how um, aware are you of bodily sensations, our interoceptive group actually dropped their awareness reports with greater precision, which I think is so interesting um, relative to the control group. And then we also replicated our drop in anxiety in our interoceptive AD group, um, whereas we did not get uh, drops uh, to the same extent in our control group. And Ahead of time, we pre-registered our measure of recovered, um, which we defined somewhat liberally, but this was an autistic population of very high anxiety, that a six point drop in trait anxiety and a score below 55 would be our measure in this case for recovered. And we saw over 30% of our AD individuals reach this criterion whereas half of our active control individuals did. And this beneficial effect on anxiety remained extended three months after uh, our end of our trial. Um, and we're just analyzing the one year data, follow up data now. Um, uh, and in terms of the pre pro scan, we looked at how insular activity and connectivity change of interceptor training there was no differences in insular activity following pre versus post interceptor training, but there were enhancements in insular connectivity. So using a uh, right insular seed, um, we found enhanced coupling with ventral medial prefrontal cortex that correlated with enhanced interceptive accuracy. And using the left insular as a seed, we found um, enhanced activity in this ACC area that also coupled to enhance interceptive accuracy. I also find some of the testimonials um, of autistic individuals who underwent this quite moving and, and I'd like to share some of these with you as well. So one individual said, um, as the inner channel gets clearer, the outer channel gets more quiet, which I find so fascinating. Um, and a hypersensitivity to different external stimuli is something you often see in autistic individuals. They often feel overwhelmed by different extraceptive cues. And this makes me wonder whether the senses are a bit like a seesaw, so that if they're overwhelmed by external stimuli but have poor precision into interception, but you're able to then enhance the clarity of the interceptive channel, then maybe you can rebalance that seesaw between interceptive and extraceptive processing. Um, another individual said, when I notice the impacts of anxiety on the body, I'm more aware of them and I'm able to reassure myself that it's just a physical reaction. And better, I am better at taking deep breaths and trying to slow my breathing and heart rate down rather than letting it spiral. And I think this speaks to the not worrying aspect. So it's important to have precision into the signal, but not worry about it. And, and then I think this is also speaking to how early access also helps with early regulation. So if you're just starting to fill your heart ramp out and you're starting to get in an anxiety state, it's easier then to regulate yourself than if you're only aware of it once you're in the middle of a panic attack or a meltdown. And early access can be a cue to better regulation. And then finally, one individual said, I believe it's increased my awareness of hunger. And as a result, I remember to eat, drink, go to the toilet. And this potentially speaks to a debate that's happening in interoception research right now, where we don't know the extent to which interoception um, is comparable across the different senses. 
Uh, and this potentially speaks to enhancing interception in one bodily axis, may also generalize or extrapolate to other bodily axes as well. We're not there yet. I think this is a really exciting therapy. It clearly wasn't effective in everyone. There may be some people who are more receptive to it and it's very early days, but I'm excited about where it may lead and, and other clinical groups it might be applicable for. And I'm delighted to say that I'm collaborating with two um, uh, clinicians and psychiatrists at um, uh, Cambridge, um, uh, Jesus and Kate, where we're hoping to extend this uh, into um, uh, a psychosis, uh, autism, co-diagnosis group, um, along with Kathy Greenwood and other people uh, at Sussex. Um, so fingers crossed that we're able to, uh, to do some of that work. Um, and then uh, in terms of another dimension, um, Moving on, uh, so there's also interceptive awareness, which I call um, this sort of metacognitive dimension. So I talked a bit about how accuracy doesn't necessarily align with self-report measures and the mathematical correspondence of accuracy and self-report can denote insight or aware metacognitive awareness measures. And these are also of interest. Um, and this is work that's um, just been submitted now, which is looking at interception and feelings of dissociation in the individuals with first episode psychosis. Um, and this was done in collaboration with Kathy Greenwood and colleagues at Sussex. And here we're interested in first episode psychosis. It was an all male sample um, and matched healthy controls. Um, and we again looked at this heartbeat discrimination paradigm presenting toned in sync or out of sync with the heart. Um, and we had a condition where we got people to focus on the heart as the interceptive condition, or we got people to focus on the notes and we had one rogue note that was of a different frequency. So we can look at accuracy in the interceptive and the extraceptive domain. We also looked at confidence again in the interceptive and extraceptive domain after each trial. And then finally, we looked at insight, which is the confidence accuracy correspondence using something like area under the REC curve or meta D prime. And we can have this insight measure both for interception and extraception. Contrary to our predictions, we actually didn't find any difference in interceptive accuracy, um, confidence or insight um, uh, between our patients and our control individuals. Um, across interceptive and extraceptive measures. Um, this was a very hard task, as I say, people often perform at chance at it in terms of accuracy, um, but you can see that measures were comparable, but really the strong individual group differences emerged as a function of dissociation. So our FEP patient group had far greater measures of the clinical symptom of dissociation as ascertained as a CDS scale. And this scale has four different subscales, alienation from surroundings, which is this um, sort of derealization component where you don't feel integrated in the world. There's this anomalous subject of recall where you potentially feel dissociated from your own memories. And there's this emotional numbing component where you feel removed from your own emotions. And there's finally this anomalous bodily experience component. And dissociation can, can be subdivided into these different domains. And we had these different measures on our x-axis and on our y-axis, it was always this interceptive insight measure. And across these different domains, Interceptive insight was inversely coupled to the dissociation scores, particularly the alienation of the surroundings. So the more interceptive insight you had, the less alienation from surroundings you had. So there was something about insight that potentially um, helped you feel more integrated in the world um, and integrated and related to your uh, memories as well. When we looked at the brain, the area um, of the insula also seemed to be particularly coupled to both 
interceptive insight and to um, uh, scores of dissociation. So higher insular activity was reduced, was associated with um, both interceptive insight and inversely related to dissociation. So again, it's something about interception, particularly in the metacognitive domain, which helps you feel grounded in some way to your body in the world and particularly the world. And then finally, um, uh, this is my last data slide, uh, which is work that I'm doing right now. This is literally work in progress. And I just threw it in because I'm so excited by it, um, where uh, we're looking at this um, augmented reality task where we're, it's in collaboration with people at Zurich and it's such a cool task. And it's looking at sort of putting our senses just a little bit out of synchrony with each other to see how they're integrated. Um, and you do this by putting a slight delay to the visual feed while having um, touch happen in real time. And we're looking at how dissociation may change with these um, multi-sensory integration uh, parameters. Um, but what fell out the data first, um, uh, irrespective of this time delay, was this really interesting effect of the heart on, on self-stroking and other stroking. So as a measure of touch, we um, get people to stroke themselves or have other people stroke them. And uh, these measures of the heart are looking at cardiac deceleration, so an elevation above is the heart uh, slowing down. And you can see that for people who are low in dissociation, the heart slows down when other people touch them, but not when they touch themselves. Whereas people with higher levels of dissociation, they get this pronounced cardiac deceleration response, both when other people touch them and when they touch themselves. And we're in the process of unpicking this data and looking further at it, but I really wanted to flag these measures because I think people often look at heart rate and heart rate variability, but actually looking at these beautiful acceleration and deacceleration curves on a moment to moment basis also reveals something beautifully interesting about the heart and how these different patterns may link to different symptoms. So in terms of implications for new treatments, um, uh, and this really come, takes me full circle right back to the start where I was really inspired to look at the role of the body when it came to PTSD. And there's actually a clinical trial that's happening now in the States and should really be near completion in a number of leading institutions. They're looking, they're looking at Lasartan, which is um, a blood pressure medication, and it's looking at how Lasartan could potentially be a treatment for PTSD. And this blood pressure medication acts on the cardiovascular system, just this exact system that can augment fear memories and fear processing. Um, uh, and I, I think it's wonderful and that potentially this could be a route using blood pressure medication to target PTSD. And it nicely aligns with this work that I did uh, demonstrating the capacity for these cardiac signals to selectively facilitate their processing. There was also interesting work that was done at UCL where they analysed medical records um, uh, of individuals in Sweden and they found that individuals um, with severe mental illnesses such as schizophrenia and bipolar had a 10 to 20% reduction um, of episodes if they were taking medications like statins. So med commonly used medications that act again on the heart and the cardiovascular system seem to be protective from uh, mental health conditions. And this is seen from just such a different perspective of just analyzing large scale mental health records and the incidence of these different conditions. So I think it potentially is exciting for um, pointing how drugs that target peripheral systems could be important for these different conditions. So challenges and conclusions. Interception can be delineated across different levels and different axes. Some of these levels correspond, others can be dissociated. 
and associations may be particularly prevalent in clinical conditions. We need better measures. Um, this is still a relatively early field um, and it's an exciting time to be in interception as we try and uh, discover and create new measures. And we need to give thought as to what they're actually targeting. There's a lot of interceptive accuracy at the moment, but actually I believe all of these interceptive levels are informative uh, and looking at the selective disruption may be particularly informative for different clinical conditions. And finally, a comprehensive normative understanding of these um, different levels can help show how they're disrupted in clinical conditions. And this potentially helps open new avenues for treatment targeting these different levels. So I would like to thank uh, um, the funders uh, who helped make this research possible. Hugo Critchley, who was initially my postdoc mentor and now is one of my closest collaborators, um, Lisa and James, who did enormous amounts of work leading the clinical trial and autistic individuals, and all uh, the rest of the lab and my collaborators. And thank you all so much for listening. <laughs>